Now we're going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn again to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we're going to keep on in our series in the book of Romans. We're in the last section. We're not, in the, we're not at the end, but we're in the last section. And our title this morning is A Living Body. A Living Body. Last week we talked about a changed body and we were talking more about the physical, especially in verse 1, but in verse 2, the spiritual. And today we're going to see how Christ, how, how God through Paul takes that spiritual or that physical body and illustrates the spiritual body. So Romans chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible with you or you just want to follow along on the screen, you're, you're always welcome to do that. Our reading this morning will start with verse 3. Verse 3 says this, For so I say, for I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many... Are one, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having them gifts differing according to the grace that is in us that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, he that exhorts on exhortation, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity, he that rules with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. We're going to stop there with our reading this morning. Let's pray again. Father, I want to stop and have our hearts quieted and our hearts focused that we might now, as we've been singing, as we've been sharing together, as we've been praying together, as we've been listening, all in preparation of having our eyes upon you, we do want to truly bless the Lord, all of my soul. We do want to see how holy, holy, holy you are. And Father, it is not just what you do in the majesties of heaven, but it is what you are asking us to do for you on this earth. And so may we see that through the body of Christ this morning. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're in a series in the book of Romans. The theme of the book of Romans is the gospel of God. I will review this every time because you, we're, we're jumping into the middle. We're always getting into the middle of it. I had, a, I had a couple of opportunities to get in water this week. I was out at camp on Thursday and we were putting the boat in the water and the, the motor doesn't have a little electronic thing that the goes down and goes back up like most do. You have to get in and do it by hand. So I got in the water a little more than I was planned on because I forgot how far it is to the back of the boat to reach the motor to put it down. Let me tell you something about getting in the water when you're not ready for it. The best way is not to think about it. Not to think about it. And it was only like 60 degrees outside, but the water was actually pretty warm because of the sunny days. So I just didn't think about it and just charged in, get this done as quickly as possible. That's a better way of doing it. But when you charge into things, you need to think about it. When you charge into the Word of God, you need to think about where you are. The theme of Romans is the gospel of God. The first three chapters is the need for the gospel. Why do we need the gospel? And we must never forget that. We must always remember that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And, and there's, that's no different for anybody else in this room. And we're still sinners. And we still need a Savior even though we have a Savior. We need that Savior to walk with us through our lives. Number two, the gospel is by faith. Don't ever forget that. It is not of works lest anyone should boast. Thirdly, you need to understand the gospel. How it works. Chapter 7 and 8. Chapters 9, 10, 11 is the gospel in Israel. How does it apply to the Israelites? Because this was a major change. Now we're going to look at 
the living of the gospel. Living the gospel. How do we put this into our practical, everyday life? This morning our title is A Living Body. A Living Body. The Christian is not a solo act. The Christian is not a lone ranger. A Christian is not one to be out there totally by himself. I, I'm just amazed how many Christians think that it's all right that they just go wherever and whatever and do whatever they want without any consideration for the rest of the body of Christ. And there's two things about this body. Number one, there's what we call a universal body, and some theologians don't like that term. The problem is they can't come up with a better one. So until they do, we will use that term. The universal church, the universal body, all believers from the day of Pentecost until the rapture. Number two, there's the local body. There's a local body. There's a local congregation. Both are biblical. Both are commanded. And just so you know, that whole series on the church that we did a few years ago, that is up on the website now. So if you ever want to go back and if you didn't hear that series, you want to listen to it, you can. If you want to review it, you can. I think there were 26 different messages in that series. And so there's something for you to study. But it's a living body. Both the universal body, the universal church and the local church, they're living bodies, living organisms. Now, here's my question for you this morning. Actually, again, I have two questions. I'm, I'm trying to get away from two. Are you serving Jesus Christ and the, and the how? Now, if you say, well, I come to church, that's not serving Jesus Christ. That's, that's being obedient and being in fellowship. You should be in church. But where are you serving in the body? Where are you contributing? Where are you contributing? You know, when my kids are little, I give them a couple of years where they don't have to contribute. I don't make my two-year-old do the dishwasher. I don't make my three-year-old clean his own room. When he's four, that's about, that's about time. If you make the mess, you can clean it up. But as they get older, what do we do? You start pitching in. And you have this chore and that chore. So it is with the body of Christ. We need each, each believer to chip in in different ways. My question is, are you serving Jesus Christ? How? Second one, where? Where are you serving? Not everybody will serve in the same place. Different ones will serve in different places. All right, let's see this service. Now, let me give you, before we give you, uh, the title this morning is A Living Body. There's a living body. Recognize that? That's from a couple of years ago, one of our baptism services. I love that picture because we've got some... There's some older people there. There's some young people there. There's some children there. And uh, some of it might be a little foggy. Myron, I think that's you standing up, going to your seat. And uh, so anyway, now there's a living body. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to have a picture of a dead body. And she says, I hope not a real one. Well, how about clip art? Okay? I hope this morning that you know the difference between this and this. You see, this, this body is living. This body has life. This body can serve. This body can work together. This body ain't going to do nothing. I know that's grammatically poor and incorrect. This body is in the casket. This one's going to do nothing but be put in the ground and rot. So if you want to accomplish something, you want to do something, you need to have a living body. Let me tell you something. If you want to do something this week, you need to have a living body, don't you? See, if you have the body that's in the casket, you're not going to accomplish much. No, you're not going to accomplish anything except rot. Let's look at some things. Let's look at, first of all, humble service, verse 3. The serving body of Jesus Christ. Humble service. Verse 3 says this, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's a long verse. Let me pick out a few things. Let me go walk through here. First of all, there's gracious humility. Look what it says there in that first phrase. For I say through the grace 
May I insert a word? Already given unto me. Already given unto me. The grace that you need as a believer has already been given to you. The resources that you need as a believer are already in your possession. Now, you may not be fully exercising. You may not know how to use them all. Did you ever get somebody and then you didn't know how to use it? It's like, I remember watching somebody once that got their first computer. And they say, what do I do now? I said, well, you need to turn on. And they say, how? Press this button. Press this button. Get into a car. Go into a home. How do you do it? You have to be taught. How do you do it? He says, this grace has already been given to you. It's already in your possession. Now, you need to put it to use. Secondly, it's, it's equal humility. Look what it says there in that verse. It says, for I say through the grace that already has been given unto me, to what? Every man. If you're sitting in this room this morning, you have this grace. You have this ability. You have this humility. He, he, he says, it's already given to every man that is among you. He was not saying this is just for the pastors and teachers. This is just for the deacons. This is just for the, for the missionaries. He says this is everybody. Does it look the same? No. Does it work the same? No. But you all have it. You have it. I have it. It's the same among you. Also, thirdly, it's thinking humility. He says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to what? Think of himself more highly than he ought to think. <laughs> it's a thinking. Now, you ought to be thinking. You ought to be thinking. Now, I've, I've realized something through many, many years of marriage. I have figured out that God created men with a switch that somehow you ladies didn't get. Do any of you ladies have trouble going to sleep at night? Because you just keep thinking and keep thinking and keep thinking. And you turn our, at least this, this is the way it is. I'll, I'll, this is the way it is in our household. And I've talked to some other couples and it's similar there. And, and I, can, I can lay down and I can turn over and get comfortable. Four, three, two, one. I'm gone. Not always that fast, but close. And my darling wife has looked at me for the last 31.9 years and said, how do you do that? And I said, oh, well, I just lay down and I switch it off. And there, there are some times I can't do it, I will admit. There are some times, but mostly I can. Some of you guys are smiling at me, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I lay down and switch it off, but some of you are laying there and thinking... You're thinking, and, and, and so the other, the other night I knew I was, I was going to camp to work on a project, so I, I couldn't go right to sleep, so I was thinking through that project in my mind, hoping to bore myself to death, and, you know, what's wrong with this? Why isn't it working? So we got to do this, change the solenoid, put a starter in, change a belt or whatever, and yeah, it took me a couple minutes, but I was out. But sometimes, we're thinking, as a Christian, you ought to be thinking. We need thinking Christians. We need Christians whose minds are going. But it needs to be a thinking humility. Don't think more highly of himself than you ought to think. Notice it doesn't say don't think. Just think correctly. Don't think the wrong way. But to think soberly. An honest humility. Truthful. No spin, as we say in the 21st century. But to think soberly as God has dealt to every man what? The measure of faith. Think, so, think soberly. That means sound judgment. And it says, as God has dealt to everyone the measure of faith. Can I just stop there and let's, let's pull over to the side of the road and talk about this one. I hear every once in a while, and, and I, every once in a while I listen to a preacher on the radio as I'm traveling somewhere and and there's this one guy, he's really good. And, and man, I just thought of so wonderful. And, and, and then a couple weeks ago, I was listening to him, and he says, well, you know, the way you, reason you have that problem is you don't have enough faith. And it's like, okay, 
Well, what you need to do, you need to have more faith, and if you get more faith, then you can solve that problem. And I thought, oh, 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 oh. What does the Bible say here? He says, God has given to you a measure of faith. Now, cooks, not the people that cooks, the job that cooks, how do you measure things? You take a, three, a three-quarter cup and you put flour in it until it's full. Did you ever try to put three-quarters of a cup of flour in a one-quarter cup measuring cup? It doesn't work. God has given to you a measure or a quantity of faith. He sometimes says, oh, you of little faith. He knows you have little faith. He knows I have little faith. But he says, you have the faith that I have given to you. And he doesn't berate you because you have a quarter cup and you're trying to put three quarters into it. And he says right here, he's given unto each of us a measure of faith. And some he's given more and some he's given less. That's what it's saying here. Don't mix that up. So humble servant. In other words, realize not only your ability, but also realize your limitations. They're there. But don't quit because your limitations are shorter than other people. God has a place for you. So there's humble service. Number two, there's individual service. Verse 4, as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. In the church, ladies and gentlemen, in the church of Jesus Christ, in the local church, that's what I'll focus on this morning, there are many members in one body. Misty's going to have surgery tomorrow morning. Misty, make sure they operate on the right part, okay? Make sure it's your shoulder and your left shoulder. You do not want her going in and getting her shoulder surgery on her right foot. All right. When I went in for my surgery a couple years ago on my eyes, I didn't want them doing that surgery on my gallbladder. My gallbladder might see good, but it wouldn't help me at all. What would you do if you put a new lens in a gallbladder? It really wouldn't help, would it? All right. So you have to have, you have different parts of the body. You have the feet. You have the legs, you have the arms, you have the head, you have the torso, you have the fingers, you have the joints. You have all these different parts and they all play their own part and individually they can do nothing by themselves, but together they work in a great orchestrated feat of success. And he says, so we have in this body, we have individual, we have many members. No one member is all alone. They're in one body, and it says here, all members have not the same office. They're, notice, they're joined together. They're in one body. They're not separate from each other. This is why believers need to be together in the local church. This is taught over and over and over in Scripture, that we are a body. If you take your hand and chop it off and lay it out in the middle of the street, I'm going to tell you there's only one thing it will do. It will rot. It will be bird food. But if it's joined together with the rest of the body and it's getting its nourishment and life and health with the body, it will be a living part of your body that will be, that will be fruitful and successful and beneficial. But if it's left by itself, it will be worthless. Except to feed the birds a good lunch. There are different offices. Now that word office doesn't mean the office of a deacon or office trustee. What it says is many responsibilities, many roles many functions. So there's all different people and different ones. I'm glad. Have, ladies and gentlemen, have you, have you noticed our lawns lately? You notice how nice they're looking? They've always looked nice, but we've got some... Bob retired after Cliff retired, and we've got a couple new 20-some-year-old guys doing it. And, and they're just they're doing a bang-up job. Matter of fact, I had a man... A man came to visit me from Iowa a week ago, and he complimented me. I'll, I'll just pass this on, because not just those guys, it's, it's many here, and the flowers, and he says, man, your property looks beautiful. And I pass that on to you. This is a nationally known man. Actually, it was Dr. Maxwell from Faith Baptist Bible College, the president. And we were talking about Hispanic ministry, and he says, I just want to tell you, grounds look great. I said, well, we've got a good crew. They do it. All right? So not everybody can do that, but those people don't always do other things. Different ones have different functions, and they're all important. 
And it's not that one's more important than the other. You go ahead, you tell your arms that they're more important than your feet and see if your feet walk out on you. No, full pun intended. All right? Individual service, but corporate service. Look at verse 5. So then we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. We are many. Many. We are always individuals. Understand that. We are always individuals. Everybody in this room here is individual. Everybody has their own personality. Everybody has their own gifts. Everybody has their own quirks. All right? Everybody's got their little things that will drive somebody else crazy. And some, everybody has some things that are just very endearing about them. But we're different. We're individuals. We don't stop being individuals because we're part of a body. Your arm doesn't stop being an arm because it's connected to the leg. The leg doesn't stop because it's connected to the waist. The waist doesn't stop because it's connected to the head. Your heart doesn't stop being a heart because it's connected to the lungs. I can go on and on, okay? They're individual parts. They don't stop being individual parts, but they're part of the corporate body. And every one of them, you're part of the what? The body of Christ. See, it's very clear there. And every one members one of another. Or we're connected. We're connected. So there is humble service. There is individual service. There is corporate service. And fourthly, there is gifted service. Now let me walk through it. It talks about spiritual gifts here. Now let me, let me just phrase this and introduce this. Not, er not everybody agrees with me. We have great discussions about this. We have different views upon this. There are three basic... Okay, I'm doing it again. I say three and hold up four. There's three views of this. View number one is all the gifts are still in function today. All right? That's view number one. View number two is some of the gifts are still in function today. You know where I'm going with this. Number three is none of the gifts are in function today. I'm between two and three. That's where I am. Because I have to go back and you have to study 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12. It's very convenient that they're both chapter 12s because it's easier to remember that way. It's, but to say, what were the spiritual gifts for? And especially if you study 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you will see that the, the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 were a temporary measure to authenticate the word of the apostles until the word of God was completed. If that is the true meaning and definition and purpose of spiritual gifts, then once the Word of God was completed, then common sense says that we no longer need those spiritual gifts. And according to 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect, the Word of God is come, that which is in part, the gifts shall be done away. So therefore we no longer need the gifts and the gifts have ceased. That seems that that's my that's my line of understanding and thinking. But also, we still do we still have gifts, or does God gift us? I believe yes, He does. See, there's my paradox with it all. Is it the same way, supernatural way that it was back in in the early church? I don't think so. But does God still gift and talent His people to serve Him? I definitely think so. There are some people here that are better at some things. I've told you many times, do not ask me to sow for you. Okay? Do not ask me to sow for you. You see some of the buttons that I put on, and you will never ask me to sow for you. They may be functional, but they're not very pretty. There are some things... Cooking, well, if, you are, if you're dying and you have no, nothing to eat, you come see me. I will, I will enable you to subsist. But you will not get gourmet cooking out of me. You go see my wife for that. She'll do that. And the sewing, she's good at that too. But if you, if you need some, something else in some other areas, then I might be able to help you because I'm gifted in those areas, but I'm not gifted in every area. But everybody is gifted in some area. And they were supernatural gifts back in this day, and he has a whole list. And he says in verse 6, he says this, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. 
Do you remember back up in verse 4 or verse 3 how we each have a different measure of faith? Verse 6 tells us that we're given different grace. God deals with us individually even though He deals with us as one body. And I'm not, I, I don't want to at all undo your individuality. That's what happens to people. Well, if I become part of the body of Christ, I'm going to have to fall in line and conform with everybody else and I'll lose my individuality. Says who? Since when? Pete's sake, I don't want you all alike. Do you? If you did, who would they be like? I wouldn't want everybody like me, and I wouldn't want everybody like you, so we're done. We're up a creek. No, isn't it beautiful? We're all individuals. God's gifted us differently. We look different. We talk different. We think different. But he takes all of this individual differentiality and puts it all together within one harmonious, loving, serving body. I think that's the coolest thing God ever did. Let's create the local church. Well, let's look at some of these different ones. So he brings them together. They're able. He's given them different grace. He's given them different gifts. Every member service individual individually, then giving gifts, differing according to the grace that's given to us. First one is prophecy. Service of prophecy. Now that's foretelling and forthtelling. Foretelling is to tell ahead of time. If you look up in the Greek, this word that's in, in the Greek, what it basically means is giving out the Word of God. Giving out God's Word, God's message. You say, well, why did Elijah, why was he a foreteller? Why was Isaiah a foreteller? Why was Jeremiah a foreteller? Why was John the Baptist a foreteller? Very simple. The written word wasn't come yet. The written word wasn't here yet. See, I'm a foreteller. I can say I am a prophet. I'm not a foreteller, though. I can't look into the Ouija board. You're going to meet... No. Okay. I can say this. If you drive the car with your eyes closed, you're probably going to crash. All right? That's as much as I can do. But I can tell you what's in this book. I can forth tell, I can tell forth what's already written here. You see, Elijah didn't have this. Samuel didn't have this. Moses didn't have this. Moses wrote the first five books, but he didn't write it until after it happened. So they were foretellers because the Word of God was not complete. So they needed prophesying, but he needs prophets today to tell what is now written and what is completed. And so he says there's a gift of prophesying. He says if you have the gift of prophesying, then you better prophesy. According to the proportion, what? Proportion of faith. Again, God has different given to different people in, in a in a apportionment in a graduated style and some have more than others and it's not saying that all should or need to have the same Romans chapter 12 verses 3 and 6 bear that out second gift is ministry ministry you know what that word ministry is in the Greek it's diakonos or diakonos I think is the right form you know what diakonos comes into? Deacon. You know how it is in Spanish? Diakonos. <laughs> I love that. First time I said to Pastor Moises several years ago, I said, you know, we're going to have a deacons meeting. He's deacons? I said, oh, he said, diakonos. I said, yeah, diakonos. I recognize that word. We're speaking the same language, only yours is Spanish and mine's Greek. I don't know. But the word diakonos isn't necessarily a man on a pedestal with this service and supposed to do this and this. What it means is servant. He's a servant of the church. And that's what it means. He gives the office of serving, of being a deacon. And not all deacons, not all deaconing, deaconing people. Can I say that? I don't know. We'll edit that out if not. Not everybody who deeks is a deacon. Not everybody who serves is a deacon. 
You can serve, okay? That, that's where people get in the problem. When we get to Romans chapter 16, we're going to talk about Phoebe. And she is called there a servant of Jesus Christ. And it's from the word diakonos. And some people say, oh, there's a first female deacon. No, it's not talking about an office. It's talking about an action. And there's a difference. Don't read more into it than what's there. There is a word that you use all the time. It's the word car. But there is a brand of auto car. There's a truck called auto car. One is the brand. One is just the term. One is the term of service. One is the term of office. Service of ministry, of teaching. Third one is teaching or clear explanation and instruction. So he says, listen, if you, if you have that gift of ministry, then wait on your ministering. Do it. If you have the gift of teaching, he that teaches, do the teaching. Number four, the gift of expert exhortation. That is the word, the beseech, that we often translate beseech. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Where do we see that verse, huh? We saw that just a little while ago in verse 1. He says, if you have that call, if you have that gift of exhortation, then you should be exhorting, you should be calling. And fifthly, the one of giving. The one of giving in verse, in verse 8. He that gives, let him do it with what? Simplicity. Just give. Talking mostly here about materially, financially, sharing what you have, but it also talks about the whole stewardship thing of, of time and talent as well. What are you sharing with the body that God has given to you? And you ought to be giving of time, talent, and treasure. Number six is the service of ruling. That is the same, that is the wor same word as bishop or oversight, to lead or give leadership or give direction. We're studying Joshua in the English adult Sunday school class. We're studying Joshua there. It is so neat to look at Joshua and see how God brought him to that place of leadership and service. It didn't happen overnight. He went through a long training program. It's a service of ruling, oversight, leadership. Some people are gifted at that. Some people aren't. Some people see the big picture and see the direction. Some people don't. Some are chiefs. Some are Indians. Some are leaders. Some are followers. But those who have the gift of leading, let them lead. And the last one, they're ruling. And the last one, he that shows mercy. Well, let me back up. He that ruleth, do it with diligence. Do it with diligence. Don't slack off. Service of, minute, of mercy, he that shows mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. How would it be if you're having, everything's going wrong for you, you know, your car is broken down, your dog bit you, you now have a broken leg and you're lying in the hospital and someone comes to see you as you're laying in the emergency room and says, well, I didn't really want to come to see you. I really don't even like being in the hospital. I don't even like you, but I have the gift of mercy. So I'm here. There's the door. Walk ye through it. <laughs> and don't let it hit you on the backside. Nurse, will you change my room? You wouldn't like that, would you? Oh, someone comes in. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. Joe, you broke your leg. What happened? And the dog bit you too? Oh, goodness, and you kicked the cat? I'm so sorry. Oh, I couldn't wait. I just wanted to come down and see how you're doing because I was really worried and concerned about you. Now that's cheerfulness because I want to be here because I like being here even though you're going through dire circumstances. If I can encourage you in any way, he that shows mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. There's just seven gifts. Prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, and mercy. Those are not all of them. That's not all the ministry in the church. But they're different and distinct. The one that can do one may really be rotten at doing the other. But this one can do this one well that this one can't do. And God takes this one and this one and this one that are all different, all distinct, all individual, and he puts them together in beautiful harmony. 
and ties them together with the blood vessels filled with the love and blood of Jesus Christ. And he sends them together to do his work. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a living body. That's a living body. If you chop your arm off and lay it out here in the parking lot, it will do no one any good. But if it's attached to your arm and it's healthy and it's fed and it's cared for, it can be of great service for years and years to come. But the individual Christian that's out there laying separate, detached, will not help the body of Christ at all. But when it's attached to the rest of the body, it can be service for him like you wouldn't believe. Now, let me just ask you this. Where are you in the body of Jesus Christ? Where in the body of Jesus Christ are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm a little bit redundant there, but... Where are you? Maybe, maybe you're searching. Maybe you already know. Maybe you already know. You say, I, Pastor, I'm, I'm here. I'm there. This is where I am. That's great. Wonderful. Got you plugged in. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, man, I just don't know where I fit in. Then that sounds like you and I need to talk. Then we need to chat. And, and don't be scared because some people say, well, if I join a church, you're going to bring me up front and make me lead, lead singing. Trust me, I am not going to make you lead singing unless you can and want to do it. You ever notice there's more people in the pew than up here? <laughs> That may not be your area. It may be teaching. It may be not. It may be serving. It may be not. It may be public. It may be private. You would be surprised how many different people during the week in this church serve quietly and privately that you don't see and you don't know. Spend a week around here and you'll see it. God needs everyone. Every part. Because a foot missing a toe is called an amputation. And that's not how God intended it. Would you bow with me, please? Bow with me for a moment. And I want you just to ask, you to ask yourself that question. And maybe it's because you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would invite you to accept Him today. If you do know Jesus Christ is your Savior and you followed Him in baptism, if you haven't, that's one thing you need to do. Then maybe you need to join the local body. You need to officially say, I'm in. I'm here. What do I need to do? Maybe you're here this morning you've already done that. You've accepted Christ as your Savior. You've followed Him in baptism and you're part of this local church. You're already a member. Membership is simply accounting of who's in and who's not. Who gets to vote? Who gets to serve? It's an official tally. But you'll say, now, where do I fit in? Where do I fit in? And let me just ask you, if that is your need, if there is something, if, if you need to figure out where you fit or you need to fit in somewhere or you need to join or you need to be baptized or one of those things, see me afterwards. We'll be glad to talk to you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you that it is so clear to us. Father, thank you that it repeats things. It tells us over and over, so we make sure we don't miss anything. Thank you for this beautiful picture of the body of Christ. Thank you that we can serve you, that we can be part of this body, and we can serve you together. We're all different. We're all individuals. And thank you for the way you've woven us together. Father, if there's one that needs to know Christ or needs to be baptized or needs to join this fellowship or needs to be serving, may they talk to us today before they leave that we may know where you would have for them. And Father, will you do a work that only you can do? And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.